Memoirs of the Invasion of France by the Allied Armies and of the last six months of the reign of Napoleon, including his abdication, written at the command of the Emperor by Baron Fein, First Secretary of the Cabinet. Germany was lost. Nothing now remained but to save France or to fall with her. Napoleon returned to Paris on the 9th of November, 1813, and he exerted every effort to turn his remaining resources to the best account. The first words he addressed to the Senate were, a year ago, all Europe was marching with us. Now, all Europe is marching against us. A decree was immediately issued for levying 300,000 men. Engineers were ordered to proceed to the roads and fortresses of the north with directions to restore the old walls, which were formerly the ramparts of France, to lay out redoubts on the heights, to serve as rallying points in our retreats, to fortify the files in which national courage might oppose the enemy's passage, and finally to make every preparation for cutting the dikes and bridges, which it would be necessary to abandon. Orders were issued to the depots for remounting the cavalry, to the cannon foundries, the manufactories of arms, the clothing warehouses. But money was wanting. The treasury was exhausted. Napoleon had recourse to his private funds. In vain was it proposed that these funds should be set aside as private deposits, which might secure the different members of the imperial family against the reverses with which they were threatened. This advice was rejected as being of too personal a nature, and the Baron de la Bouillerie, the crown treasurer, was directed to transfer 30 millions in crowns from the private to the public treasury. Thus, public credit and every branch of the public service resumed its wanted activity. Councils of administration of war and of finance succeeded each other hourly at the Tuileries. That days were too short for the business, which was necessary to transact, but Napoleon availed himself of the night and employed the hours which should have been devoted to rest in reading what his ministers had not had time to tell him, in signing the documents which had not been dispatched in the day, and of deliberating his plans. The army of Germany had just returned within the limits of the French territory by the bridges of Mentz. It was necessary to assign to it a position where the troops might enjoy the repose of which they stood in need. This army now formed behind the Rhine, a line which was every day extending and which was soon to be prolonged from Honigen to the sands of Holland. But the exhausted state of our troops and magazines afforded no ground to hope for maintaining the defense of so extended a line. Those who considered the question merely in a military point of view became alarmed at the idea of our forces being dispersed. We could not seriously think of defending the Rhine, and therefore it was said we ought immediately to abandon it. But Napoleon was guided by other considerations. We were weak, but our weakness was a secret, which it was necessary should be kept as long as possible. The Allies, astonished at having conquered us, had halted at the sight of our territory, which they so long regarded as sacred. France, in her part from the long habit of conquering, seemed to have retained a remnant of confidence, which supported her amidst her adverse fortune. It was requisite to preserve these protective illusions. When the enemy should attack, it would be time to retrograde. Our army, therefore, received orders to maintain its station along the Rhine. The enemy would respect this barrier long enough to justify our boldness in trusting to it. And the French eagles floating on the left bank would lend support to the negotiations that were about to be renewed. Overtures for peace had just been made at the opening of the British Parliament on the 4th of November. The Prince Regent of England said no disposition to require from France sacrifices inconsistent with her honor or just pretensions as a nation will ever be on my part or on that of His Majesty's allies an obstacle to peace. On the 14th of November, Baron de saint Anyan arrived in Paris, charged by the Allied powers to make communications confirming these pacific intentions. Monsieur de Saint-Aignan was 
the Empress Equerry and had recently been minister from France to the court of Weimar. A band of partisans had removed him from his residence, but his personal reputation, his connection with the Duke of Vicenza, and the interest with which he was regarded at the court of Weimar contributed to his deliverance. Monsieur de Metternich took advantage of his return to France in order to communicate certain propositions to Napoleon. He invited Monsieur de Saint Aignan to Frankfurt. And on the 9th of November, in a confidential conversation at which we're present, Monsieur Nestle Rota, the Russian minister, and Lord Aberdeen, the English minister, Monsieur de Metternich laid down the basis of a general pacification, which Monsieur de Saint Aignan noted down from his dictation. These were the basis which Monsieur de Saint Aignan now presented to Napoleon.